Okay. So we're here today to present a sort of tutorial on manliness. And the idea is that you can take any toy that you purchase, and every electronic toy these days is a computer. It has a computer inside of it. You can reprogram it. You can make it do anything you like. So you could either use it to text message your friends using cool text message lingo, or you could use it as a spectrum analyzer. You can use it to open garage doors. Um, you can hack into smart meters with it. You can do all sorts of fun stuff with it. And in this lecture, we're going to demonstrate how to take this useless toy and make something meaningful out of it. And hopefully with some of the tricks that we present here, you'll be able to take your own toys or just grab random ones at Toys R Us from the bargain bin, rip them apart, and figure out how to put new stuff into them. Um, so we're going to begin with the television ad that introduces this product. It's a new wireless messaging device. This is a safe environment for IMing for girls. Absolutely. It's really intended for those tween girls that they want the gadgets that their parents have, that older kids have, but this is a safer option. That way they are able to instant message with their friends, but don't have to worry about people online chatting with nice. them that aren't necessary. I could be carrying this device anywhere. Like, what's the range? Anywhere? Anywhere around the world. Basically, wow. it works how a, how a cordless phone would work. You plug it into your computer, and as long as you're with, with, within range of that, you can IM. But uh -huh. your friend, even if your friend's in Japan, Switzerland, California, anywhere, you can go ahead and instant message with each other. Well, I have one last message I want to send you, and I'm going to send it to you right now. Oh, thank you. So we've stepped by this video frame for frame, and we still can't figure out what he sent. I think it was something <laughs> dirty. Uh, I mean, you know, we can only imagine. Um, so this is what the product looks like. You've got the IMME itself, which is the device on the top, and then a USB dongle for plugging it into your computer. Um, the IMME consists of a keyboard and an LCD, and then a single chip that is both the microcontroller and the radio, and RAM and flash memory. Um, so this one chip is a complete computer and radio in a single package that needs only passive components outside of it. Um, so you, you've got some analog stuff coming out of it on the radio end, but by and large, this one chip is self-contained and does everything. It does all of the I.O. directly. It does all of the radio directly. And the same chip is used in the dongle, just running different firmware. Um, there's also a USB to serial chip on the dongle, which could have been eliminated and um, it's not my favorite of chips. Um, this is what the Chipcon 1110 looks like. Um, you've got a computer in the center here, you've got some power stuff on the side, and then this side here, running the whole length of the chip, is a sub gigahertz radio. And the radio is, um, it's not really a software defined radio, but it is software configurable. So in the same way that you might process things using a USRP, you can just tell this little section of the chip how you would like the radio messages to be interpreted, and it will follow along, or translate them for broadcast and that sort of stuff. Um, there's also a little bit of writing on the chip. This is the, the company's logo. If I flip back to the previous slide, um, there's a minor chance in hell that you can see it up here in the right corner. Um, this full die photo is online in my Flickr feed. And if you need better resolution, you can email me for the 30 megapixel TIFF file. Um, you can also get it in different colors. If you're not happy with pink, you can get pink with a star or pink with a blue background. <laughs> but real men carry pink pagers. Um, uh, perhaps we should explain the real men stuff. There's a, a book in the 80s called Real Men Don't Eat Quiche that was later copied in a famous essay entitled Real Programmers Don't Use Pascal, uh, which differentiated the real programmers who switch bootloaders into computers using flip switches before they can load their programs from tape from key sheeters who use Pascal. Uh, we're, not very fan, no, we're not very fond of key sheeters, and key sheeters complain about the color of the device rather than the underlying architecture. And, and they've never implemented a debugger for this device. So you've got to be neighborly in doing these things. And if I hear one more person bitch about it being pink, I'm going to smack him or shank him. 
<laughs> Real man shank. <laughs> um, so I first got involved in the IME when Dave, who is a real man, read an article that I had written about building a debugger for the Chipcon 1110 and used that to write an Arduino program for programming the Chipcon 1110 inside of the IME. Uh, so he tapped out the wires here on the bottom. This is just beneath the battery port. So the batteries are plugged in and then there's a test port beneath it, which is how the firmware is written in at the factory. Um, to give you a, a quick overview of my article, um, this is my diagram of how to start the debugger, and then this is my diagram of how to send the bytes across. And I implemented and published a complete and working debugger for this chip as part of my GoodFET project, and I was giving away free boards, and Dave, being a real man, said the hell with all of that, and he rewrote it from scratch in an afternoon. <laughs> He then tapped different regions within the IM me. Um, this is the SPI bus connecting the microcontroller to the LCD controller, which is actually a, a separate computer that manages the LCD. Real uh, men read instant messages with an oscilloscope. Yeah. <laughs> um, so then the, the culmination of the work that he's published thus far is this. It's a, a hello world that has working keyboard and LCD support. Um, it, it's a rather minimal font, so uh, as you see it running across, so H-E-L-L-O, he actually has that written like in hexadecimal on the, uh, on the C code, but he never actually implemented the other letters, <laughs> um, which means that I had to. So I, I took his article and I quickly bought four or five IMEs and quickly destroyed one or two. Um, and and I, I used his examples to extend that into being a real operating system. Um, I also built a debugger so that key shaders could play along. Uh, real men debug in hexadecimal by speaking to the debug controller. Or toggle flipping for JTAG. That's also fun. Um, this is my programmer. It's called the GoodFet. I have about 50 that I can give away today. Uh, no charge so long as you promise to build it. If you don't, I'll hunt you down and shank you. Um, this is how I drew the remaining fonts. I wrote a, a small Python script which takes the font as hexadecimal and then draws it out in ASCII art. In order to read this, um, the most significant bit of the byte is the lowest pixel within the font. Um, so 7F means that everything but the most significant bit, the 80 bit, is set. Therefore, you wind up with this vertical line. The, um, and the, the character is written left to right. It's sort of swiped across. So unlike a television where you draw pixels in a row, here you're doing a swipe in a tall column. And they, or, sorry, in a tall row. And they can only be written as a full row. Um, when you try to implement video games for it, this becomes a bit of a hassle. Um, so I, I published a, a simple example terminal application for it, which included a random number test. Um, uh, I'm not sure how well you can read the numbers here, but this is 9064, and then if you look diagonally down, 9064, 9064, 9064, um, and there's a period between samplings of 7 FFE bytes. Um, not in the IM me, but elsewhere this was used for public key cryptography. Um, <laughs> no matter how many, uh, you'll also note that after the number that gets repeated, the one after it is also repeated. So if you get any random number from this system, you can predict all random numbers after it. And if I give you a random megabyte or a random gigabyte of data from this, there are only 65,000 unique starting positions, um, which means that a key lookup table comes in at about 20 megabytes. Um, uh, this same random number generator was used for generating Zigbee keys. And um, thanks to some patent enforcement, they're terribly, terribly sensitive to a bad random number generator. So you can rip the private key out of a machine in three or four key negotiations. 